committee shall be guided by the provision of section 6, 7, and 8 of the Act which provide, and I quote, an approval hearing shall focus on a candidate's academic credentials, professional training and experience, personal integrity, and background. The criteria specified in the schedule shall be used by a committee during an approval hearing for the purposes of vetting a candidate. Additionally, Section 7 of the Act provides that the issues for consideration by the relevant House of Parliament in relation to any nomination shall be the procedure used to arrive at the nominee, any constitutional statutory requirements relating to the office in question, the suitability of the nominee for the appointment proposed having regard to whether the nominee's abilities, experience, and qualities meet the needs of the body to which nomination is being made. The parameters espoused in Section 6, 7, and 8, 6, 7, and 8, and Section 7 of the Act shall also form the basis through which the committee shall conduct the approval hearings. Upon conclusion of the approval hearings, the committee shall proceed to prepare a report for tabling in the House in accordance with the requirements of Section 8 of the Act. It is worth noting that Article 73A and B of the Constitution provides that the guiding principles of leadership and integrity include a selection, selection on the basis of personal integrity, competence and suitability, and objectivity and impartiality in decision-making and in ensuring that decisions are not influenced by nepotism, favoritism, other improper motives or corrupt practices. Consequently, members, the committee is bound by the guiding principles of leadership and integrity and is required to conduct the approval hearings in accordance with the dictates of Article 73.2a and b. Members, in your folders, you have been provided with the copies of the Constitution and the relevant Act, so you need reference that are available to you. Second short uh, communication. Honorable members, you will recall that during our meeting held on Thursday, 13th October 2022, a question was raised by the Honorable P. Wandai, the leader of the minority party, on whether the position of the Cabinet Secretary is constitutional. As you may be aware, Article 152.1d of the Constitution provides that the Cabinet consists of not fewer than 14 and not more than 22 Cabinet Secretaries. It is notable that in compliance with the provisions of Article 152.1d of the Constitution, the President nominated 22 Cabinet Secretaries, among them being the Prime Cabinet Secretary. In this regard, the Office of the Prime Cabinet Secretary finds its constitutional basis under Article 152.1d of the Constitution, and the nominee, if approved, will be one of the Cabinet Secretaries. Further, it's worth noting that through the Executive Order No. 1 of 2022 on the Organization of Government, the President assigned specific roles to the Office of the Prime Cabinet Secretary, which includes coordinating and supervision of the ministries and state departments. However, I note that the designation of the roles of a Cabinet Secretary does not change the nature of the position of a Cabinet Secretary as anchored under Article 152, 1D of the Constitution. I further note that the Article 152 of the Constitution does not prescribe the designation of the title or functions to be conferred to each Cabinet Secretary. Consequently, it's within the powers of the President and Article 132 of the Constitution, as read with Section 10.1 of the National Government and Coordination Act No. 1 of 2013, to designate the title and assign functions to a Cabinet Secretary. To this end, the designation of a Prime Cabinet Secretary is not inconsistent with any provision of the law or the Constitution, and therefore, the designation is properly, legally, and constitutionally grounded. 